Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Over the last few years, last 10 years perhaps, uh, orthodontic bonding has certainly become quite popular. And with us today we have Mr. Paul Ganji, who is the owner and founding father of Reliance Orthodontic Products. Uh, Paul is, has certainly been one of the people involved in the development of these various bonding systems. And he's with us today to give us an overview on exactly how bonding works. Paul, you want to thank you very much for being here. Thank you. You want to start out by talking about the mechanics of bonding. What is it exactly that we're trying to do? Actually, what we're doing is by the elimination of bands, we're, we're taking a metal or a plastic bracket or an appliance and we're bonding it directly to the enamel. In order to do that, we have to first condition the enamel uh, or etch the enamel uh, and, and cleanse the enamel. And then we're bonding to it with a, an adhesive. And the adhesive, of course, would bond uh, either chemically or mechanically. There are two classifications of bonding. How, how do they differ? Mechanical lock is exactly the way it sounds. It's, a, it's an interlocking or an interface, interlocking between the adhesive and the enamel or the adhesive and the bracket base. A chemical adhesion would be an actual fusion of the two materials, uh, say the adhesive and the, and the bracket or the adhesive and the enamel. It's an actual chemical fusion. Uh, now, bonding to the enamel with the current bonding materials that are being used today, it's 90% mechanical and 10% chemical. And on the other hand, bonding to the bracket, it's all mechanical, aside from using maybe a plastic bracket, which you would have to use a primer to get a chemical bond with. Mm -hmm. What are the main types of bonding systems available commercially today? There are, there are three systems uh, that are basically uh, available today. Uh, the first and foremost would be the uh, seal and paste system or the mix system. Then there would be the no mix or one step system. And both of these, by the way, fall into what's called a chemical cure catalog chemical cure category yeah. and by that I mean is that they cure within themselves by mixing one or two parts together. Uh, the third uh, type of system of course is the light activated which uh, will polymerize or set when it's uh, exposed to a light source for a 15-20 second period of time. Now your main emphasis has been on the first two categories as far as the products that you've dealt with. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, in, in, in today's orthodontic bonding market uh, about 90 percent of all the bonding that's done worldwide is done with a chemical cure system, either mix or uh, non-mix. Now, which would you like to talk about first? I will uh, uh, reverse it and go towards the no-mix system first, and uh, I'll go through basically the uh, procedure with it and the do's and don'ts and the reasons why uh, it does work. What are the most common uh, commercially available no-mix systems? All of your major companies uh, manufacture a, a no-mix adhesive system, uh, Ormco with System 1, uh, Unitech with Unite, uh, Lee Pharmaceuticals with Instabond, um, Rocky Mountain with Monolock, TP Labs with uh, Rideon. GAC? GAC makes one which is called uh, Ortholock. And of course, uh, Reliance, we manufacture our own, which is called Reliabond. Okay. Now, how does this exactly, how does this work? The first step in the bonding procedure is to, of course, uh, profi, uh, the enamel surface that's going to be bonded with a uh, flour of pumice or a, a, a paste that does not contain any fluoride or oils. Why not uh, fluoride? Fluoride or oil will definitely inhibit the potency of the etch and will reduce the etch. How about uh, fluoride treatments? It's very common to get fluoride treatments before starting that, orthodontics. Absolutely. Is that such a good idea? Uh, it's, it's recommended after the brackets are in place as opposed to prior because a fluoride treatment within two weeks uh, before uh, the etching process can once again uh, reduce the potency of your etch. Okay, now, uh, so how do you apply the, uh, the pumice? Use a, use a rotary instrument, uh, either a rubber cup or a brush, uh, and do a, a complete cleansing of that whole labial surface with the pumice. Thoroughly rinse it, dry it, now, in some states, uh, a chairside, a dental assistant, cannot use a rotary instrument. I presume a toothbrush or something of that sort could also be used in that regard. No, it's not recommended. No, uh, it recommended would, once again, is a, is a rotary instrument. Uh, the, the, the profi step is, is extremely critical. And a lot of times, using a Q-tip or a toothbrush, uh, you do not cleanse that pellicle that can be present on that enamel surface. Okay. 
All right, now, so we've, we've cleaned the teeth. Now what's next? The next step is the acid etch, which is, is nothing more than a deep cleansing of the enamel, and it's kind of carrying through the, the, the prophy stage, actually, to a further extent. And this is done with a 37% 37, 37 phosphoric acid solution. And this is applied to the two surface in a dabbing motion as opposed to a wiping. And by dabbing, I mean it's just dabbed on the enamel for a 60 to 90 second period of time. The reason we say 60 to 90 seconds is that 90 seconds would be the maximum amount of time, 60 seconds the minimum amount of time to give you a universally accepted etch, regardless of your location in the country and uh, you know the, the type of water that's present in your area. Does it make any difference whether the acid is applied in a liquid format or in a gel format? None whatsoever. The uh, gel format, of course, uh, affords you the convenience of not having the liquid run into the gingiva. The uh, liquid is a little bit easier to rinse off. What happens if you have deciduous teeth? Does this take any longer to uh, etch? Deciduous teeth should be etched in the same manner, however, for a period of 120 seconds or two minutes, which is longer, obviously, than what we're recommending for a normal adult teeth. And it's the same motion. It's a dabbing motion. Once again, do not wipe or rub the acid onto the tooth. It's a dabbing motion. Okay. All right, now we've cleaned the teeth and we've etched the teeth. And uh, presumably in etching the teeth, you are removing a small amount of enamel. Is that true or not? You do, but it's a very, very slight amount of enamel, one to two microns at the most. Uh, you're going down, your, your deep cleansing goes down an average of about 10 microns. However, you can find uh, an enamel tag that'll get cleansed down as far as 20 microns with a 60 second etch. But uh, very, very little enamel is removed during that period. If you were to go past 90 seconds with the etch on a healthy uh, adult tooth, then you would start to see some removal of enamel. Okay. All right, now the next thing, the third thing, would be the rinsing of the acid etch off of the teeth. Now, how is this done? This is the area that I feel is the most critical area in the bonding procedure, these next two steps. The rinsing uh, should be at least 10 to 15 seconds per tooth with a liquid etch and 20 to 25 seconds per tooth with a gel etch. The reason being is that a byproduct of the phosphoric acid on the enamel is a product called calcium phosphate salts, which are created on that enamel surface. These cannot be rinsed off properly with just a quick squirting of the water. They need copious amounts of water rinsed thoroughly uh, for a good 10 to 15 seconds or 20 to 25, depending on which etch you use. Okay. All right, now the next thing then would be to dry the field. So, dry some comments it, on that. Dry it with uh, oil and water-free ear, and the best way to test that is to take a Kleenex and just take your, your ear line and give it a squirt on the Kleenex to see if there is any residual uh, moisture. And this can occur a lot of times after you, you've done the rinsing process of the acid. Uh, be sure that you rinse it just with water, not with water and, oil, uh, water and air. And then make sure that you blow it out with air before you go ahead and, and even test on the Kleenex because there's guaranteed there's going to be some moisture. I mean, after you've rinsed it off, after if you've you rinsed. use a two or three way syringe. Right. Okay. All right, so then after the drying procedure, then the next step is to apply a sealant. Now, can you say exactly what the purpose of the sealant is and how they differ? Good. Uh, basically, as we were talking before, the principle of bonding is that in order to bond to etched enamel, and if I can, if I can diagram here just briefly, what I'm going to be getting at. After we've etched a tooth, this being the labial tooth surface, your enamel tags are exposed in this manner, and you need a material, a wet material that's going to flow deeply into these enamel tags all the way through. And the wet material will vary from system to system. We had talked about the no-mix adhesive. The wetness in that occurs with the primer. We talked about the mixed systems. The wetness with that occurs with the sealant uh, and with some of the other specialty adhesives, for example, Excel. The wetness occurs with the paste because the paste is a very fluid, thin viscosity and it has a built-in wetness to it. So the wetness means the penetrating ability of the material, is that correct? Exactly, in the enamel tags. Okay, so now let's say, first of all, we're going to talk about a no-mix system. Mm -hmm. So in using a no-mix system, what exactly is the sealer going to do for, for us? Okay. 
In the Nomex system, the seal is going to do two things. Number one, it is going to, in this case, polymerize the paste because it's not only a sealer here, it's actually an activator. It's a mm -hmm. catalyst for the paste. But also it will wet the enamel so that the enamel will accept the paste. And it's actually the sealant that's going to, going to uh, uh, polymerize on that enamel surface and your paste will, will attach itself to that. Okay. Now, is there anything else that we should cover in regard to the sealants per se? Okay, with a, with a no-mix uh, system, and if I can diagram this here, it will show you a little bit easier. The importance of making sure that the two surfaces that, that you're bonding are perfectly flush. Okay. We had mentioned that the primer is a catalyst also for the paste as well as being the wetting agent for mm -hmm. the enamel. Uh, this means that if you've got your two surface that is, uh, say in that manner, your bracket base must be accordingly perfectly flush because you're going to have a layer of primer on the bracket and a layer of primer on the tooth and then your paste of course is going to be on your bracket and when you apply the bracket to the tooth those two surfaces must meet perfectly flush mm -hmm. in order to assure a complete polymerization. This is one of the drawbacks of a no-mix system is that you have to be a lot more meticulous as to your your bracket contour in regards to your labial two surface. Now which teeth do you find are the ones that give the clinician most difficulty? The the, specifically, it would be the cuspids and bicuspids, and we see a, a lot of occasions where the two surface will have uh, a design such as this, your labial two surface, and you'll have a bracket base that will not conform. Uh, obviously, a bracket, uh, this type of a configuration bonded, would be a very good strong bond in through here, and a very weak bond in here, because the primer cannot penetrate the paste thoroughly, and consequently, at the mesial distal edges of the bracket, you'll have a problem. And that can be, once again, a very weak bond. Okay. Now, I think we should leave the mix system for a separate discussion. All right. Shall right. We do that? Okay. okay. Now, the next point, then, is to actually do the bonding itself, where we're going to put a bracket on, let's say, a central incisor. Okay. Now, you want to discuss the steps and how that this system here works? Okay. Very simply, after you acid etch and dry, once that tooth has been rinsed and dried, it is, and I can't emphasize enough how critical it is to keep it moisture-free and saliva-free. If at any time you feel that that tooth, that etched tooth, has been contacted by moisture or saliva, go back and re-etch for 15 seconds, and then thoroughly rinse it again. Then your first step would be to prime with the, a thin coat of the primer, liquid primer. You would apply a thin coat of it to the underside of the bracket base. Mm -hmm. Now this can be done anywhere from a minute or 10 seconds in advance to two or three hours in advance. As long as this primer is in a thin coat and wet on the, lab on the, uh, on the underside of the bracket base when you apply the paste to the bracket base. Now will that stuff stay wet as long as that? It, it'll stay wet for, a, for an extended period of time. Uh, it, once again, it's, it's, it all depends how long and your, your uh, conditions in your office. Mm -hmm. Uh, naturally, when you go to put the paste on the bracket, your staff should definitely check to see if it is still wet, thoroughly wet across that whole bracket base. Then your next step would be to paint a thin coat of the Nomex primer onto the labial two surface in this manner. Once again, being sure that you don't have any pooling uh, anywhere on that two surface. Now, you notice I went from the gingiva to the incisal. Uh, we recommend uh, that you apply any sealants or any primers from the incisal towards the gingiva only because uh, if you go from the gingiva to the incisal, you run the risk of getting the bristles of the brush under the uh, uh, gingiva and pulling down saliva with it. Now, do you have to put the sealant on the entire tooth or just in the area that the bracket is going to go on? We recommend uh, apply it uh, primarily to where the bracket is going to be placed. Any residual or uh, uh, primer that's around the periphery of that bracket base that does not contact paste will simply rush away, will simply wash away. Okay. Okay. Uh, unlike our our uh, self polymerizing sealant, uh, the this sealant will just uh, just rinse away from the periphery. All right. Now we've put the primer on both the bracket base and on the dental cast. Now. 
if it's a no mix system, obviously you don't mix it. What do you do? Uh, dispense a small amount of the paste onto the freshly primed bracket right about in the center of the base of the bracket. Then the operator would place the bracket on the tooth. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you hit the tooth with the bracket, it's good to kind of give it a little mesial distal movement to ensure that your paste is spread evenly across that bracket base. Once you've got your desired clinical position, then press on the bracket with firm pressure for a very short period of time. You'll see an excess of adhesive squirt to the periphery of the base. Do your cleanup, take off all your, your residual adhesive, and then proceed to your next bracket. Okay. Now, how long of a working time do you have with your no-mix system? Uh, our no-mix system uh, affords you 30 seconds of working time from the time you put the bracket on the tooth. So you've got about 30 seconds to get your positioning and do your cleanup with it. When you finished your last bracket in the series, give the material a full five minutes, then you can go ahead and tie in an active archway. Okay, I think five is, could you get away with three? I mean, Five's the minimum, uh, okay. to be honest with you. If ideally, if we went to 10 minutes, it uh, would be ideal, but five is, is normally is, 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 a, is a passing grade. Okay. All right, now, I guess we've pretty well covered the no-mix system, is that right? Right. I guess, just to review, uh, I think the things from my perspective that are unique about the no-mix system and certainly would be make them attractive is the fact that there's, there is no mixing and mm -hmm. the fact that you have the syringe, everything comes pre-packaged. Right. And that basically uh, you have just put the sealant on, do this, and you're home free. Exactly. Why isn't this the best way to do it then? Well, to begin with, uh, the, the strength factor between a no-mix and a mix system uh, the mix systems run approximately 10 to 15 percent higher bond strength. And that is because you're doing all the mixing on a pad before it's placed on the bracket. You're relying actually on your, on your mixing on the tooth as you place the bracket on the tooth and how well you wiggle it and how well you push it into the enamel mm -hmm. and how well you force that primer into your paste. If you put too much primer, you could have a, a bond problem, strength problem. If you put too much paste and you don't squirt it out from around the bracket, there could also be a bond problem. So to summarize, the no-mix system uh, has definite advantages from cost and time saving, but it is a very, very meticulous system. And, and it's one that, that does require to have the bracket bases adapted properly and to use a precise amount of material. All right, now we've talked about the no-mix system. I think we should now contrast that with the mix system to show the advantages and disadvantages of that. The, next, the mix system, which has been popular for several years in the orthodontic field, uh, and there are several different categories. Which uh, uh, products brands. are available today? Uh, 3M uh, manufactures one which is called Orthodontic Concise. Uh, Unitech makes one which is uh, Dynabond. Ormco makes Endure. Uh, a company makes one called Achieve, and of course our product in that class is Phase 2. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now tell me about Phase 2. Very simply, same tooth preparation with the Profi and the Etch, rinsing and drying, keeping it standard from there. Your next step is the application of a sealant. Now we were talking about the, the wet uh, bonding onto the enamel. The wetness with the mix system is in the sealant, as you'll notice. This is basically an unfilled resin that will be mixed equal portions of A and B sealant. This is mixed for a very, very short period of time, very quickly, three to five seconds on this, just to make sure the A and B come together. And then you would paint a very thin, once again, thin, uniform coat of the sealant on the enamel surface. Now this is not going to activate the adhesive later, right? This is just a, the wetness part to penetrate the enamel? Exactly, exactly. That's the primary purpose of the sealant. Because of that, you can apply your bracket with the paste on immediately or you could wait. So in other words, this sealant on the enamel can be either in a polymerized or hardened state mm -hmm. or still in a wet state and you will not affect the bond strength whatsoever. Okay, and I presume by no filled, meaning that there's no glass or quartz particles in there. Exactly, exactly. There aren't, there isn't, uh, there is no filler at all in this material. In our material, we run about uh, about an eight to ten percent amount of filler, which is a very, very small amount. Okay. Now, is it, will that sealant have any protective aspect to the teeth? 
Well, the sealant, the problem with sealants today traditionally has been what's called oxygen inhibition. Anytime you have two materials that are chemical cure materials, as opposed to a light cure material, you have what's called oxygen inhibition. Mm -hmm. And that means that the oxygen will actually interfere with the final polymerization or hardness. Uh, with the material that has a high amount of filler, such as the paste, mm -hmm. right, which can be as much as 74, 75 percent filled, mm -hmm. your oxygen inhibition, once again, is, is very, very low. All right. But with a, a sealant type system, the oxygen inhibition is very, very high, and there's, a lot, there's quite a bit of it, which means the material does not polymerize totally. It may only polymerize 50 percent. Mm -hmm. So we did two things with our phase two sealant. One, we added more catalyst and more activator to it to, to speed up the set to cut mm -hmm. down on the oxygen inhibition. Plus, we did add a small amount of filler to it. That combination gives us a sealant that is uh, more protective than some of the other conventional sealants on the market today. Okay. All right, so now we've sealed the teeth. Mm -hmm. Now the next part is to actually mix up the uh, adhesive. And in this, case, in this case, we're talking about phase two, is that correct? Right. And I'm dispensing, we have the paste available in the jar or in, in uh, uh, syringes. I'm going to dispense this out of a syringe. And it would be equal portions of part A and part B paste. Now, which is the part A, the one you just the, did? The, I did it backwards. The part B is the white, the part A is the brown paste with a color contrast so you can easily distinguish between the A and the B. Now, what is the, the B is the base. I remember the B base, mm -hmm. and the A part is the catalyst, right? Part A is your catalyst, and that simply means that the part A controls your setting time. Uh, if you were to put a, a, a disproportionate amount of A to B, uh, in other words, twice as much part A as part B, it would speed up the set time. If you put half as much part A as you put part B, you would slow down the set time. Okay. Now, how does this work? How do you actually go about mixing it up? There's three stages. Uh, with any of these any of these chemical cure materials that the that the adhesive goes through, this is the first stage, uh, which is the mixing stage, and I like to call it the dormant stage, because this is the time when you can actually mix the material, place it on the bracket, position it, do your cleanup, without the fear of of any uh, effect on the adhesive whatsoever. Okay. The next stage this material will go into is what's called the gelation period, where the activator and the catalyst are working together and they start the actual setting of the material. Mm -hmm. In the early periods of gelation, a lot of times you can't feel a difference in the paste. Mm -hmm. However, if you bond a bracket during that period of time, if you bump a bracket during that period of time, you definitely can reduce your bond strength. And then, of course, your final stage is the final hardness. That's your, your polymerized state. That's when mm -hmm. it's hardened and, and, and ready to accept an arch wire. Now, what are we at now? We're still in our, in our dormant stage or our mixing stage. And with phase two, it'll stay that way for a full two minutes. Then it goes through a very short 30 second gel period. Uh -huh. And then your final hardness is right at two and a half minutes from the start of mix. Okay, now let's say that you've reached the polymerization stage where it's done. Now, again, do you have to wait uh, five minutes afterwards or? Right, once, once you've finished your last bracket, a, a good way to, to gauge it is to put a little excess paste uh, on the mixing pad that's been mixed. When you finish your last bracket, wait till that material is hard, mm -hmm. which means it's finally polymerized. Give it five full minutes and then place your arch wire. Okay. So now what else do we need to cover with regard to the traditional mix system, one that would be used for putting brackets on? Uh, there, it's, it's, it's versatile. Uh, in other words, uh, the viscosity that we've designed uh, into phase two is one that will totally prevent bracket flotation. Bracket flotation can be very irritating for an operator, not only because of the bracket uh, be frustrating from it, from it moving out of mm -hmm. position, but if it's moving during the gel period, once again, you reduce the bond strength. Um, so our materials are designed very, very thick viscosity, no flotation. However, let's say you had an instance where you wanted to uh, do a, say, a lingual 3 to 3, or some other appliance that would require a thinner material that maybe would have some flow characteristics to it. What you can do is you can thin down your mix with the A part A sealant. If you keep this in the back of your mind that the part A sealant and the part A paste are actually the same. The part A paste 
is just simply a filled version of the Part A sealant. And likewise with the Part B, the Part B sealant is just an unfilled version of the Part B paste. Mm -hmm. So what we did here is I just put equal portions of my A and B paste down. I'm taking my Part A sealant and adding one drop of sealant to my mix. Now I could alter this, I could add more if I wanted a little bit runnier or not as much if I wanted a little thicker. Mix it, this has no effect now on the bond strength. This has no effect whatsoever on your setting time. But as you notice, it has thinned it out to the point where it would have some good flow characteristics to it. I see. Yeah, I can see what you mean. Now that brings us actually into the third type of bonding, and that is the bonding of the specialty appliance or the bonding of the acrylic splint herbst or the bonded rapid palatal expander. Uh, Paul had the experience of coming to my office several years ago uh, when I was really struggling with getting a proper bonding system. We had used a, a at the time, what was a no-mix system Mm -hmm. that really turned out to be very, very inferior after they changed the chemical composition of it after mm -hmm. a while. And one of the things that I think became, aware, became obvious to both of us is the fact that a really good bonding system for a bracket requires the opposite characteristics of a bonding system for an expander. And that is the fact that, uh, for example, you talked about bracket drift, mm -hmm. and you want a highly viscous type of material. In my case of wanting to bond a herbst or bond a, uh, uh, a bonded expander in place, I wanted very low viscosity, and I wanted things to move. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, instead of saying I want 15 seconds or a minute and a half to work, the longer the work time, the better. Right. And so that's the reason, I think, in part, why you came up with the Excel system, mm -hmm. which is a, as you call it, a specialty type of an appliance system. You want to talk about that briefly? Good. If I can go back a little bit to explain how we came into the area of Excel, uh, if you were to take this material, phase two, for example, has a two-minute working time, try to use it for indirect bonding, you would have to work quickly, obviously, or for uh, any bonded uh, specialty appliances. Uh, also, you would have to thin it out, which is no problem. However, temperature has, plays a very, very big role in the setting characteristics of all these adhesives. In order to slow this material down to, say, a three, three and a half minute set time, ideally the best way to do it would be on a cold slab. Mm -hmm. That chemically is the best way to ensure uh, that you're not going to be bonding during the gel period. And it, and it does normally extend the working time out to about three and a half minutes. Problems with working on a cold slab, of course, can be condensation uh, and the fact that anytime you work on a cold slab, it's going to definitely thicken the material. So here we've already thinned it down, but we're putting on a cold slab, now we're going to thicken it again. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we had to come out with a material that already had built into it a long working time, uh, as, as well as a material that was thin to begin with, and one that you could work with at room temperature without having to rush. And that's how we came to the Excel area. The Excel system is basically the same format as the phase two system. You would acid etch, you would mix your A and B sealant, paint that onto the labial two surface, then you would mix your A and B paste and bond the bracket or the appliance on with the A and B paste. Now we're going to take a look at this material and you'll notice the difference right away in the viscosity once I mix it. And of course in the setting time which will be extended. Once again one to one mix ratios for about 10 to 15 seconds of spatulation to just to make sure that that is a uniform color and a uniform consistency. Now because it does have a thinner viscosity, it's going to go onto the appliance a lot easier. It's going to allow you to seat your appliance, especially with a rapid parallel expander or a Herbst appliance where you're covering multiple teeth. It'll allow you to seat the appliance and be assured of getting a good fit. Mm -hmm. It also will allow the excess paste to flow out from the appliance so that cleanup is a lot easier. Yeah, I think one of the most important aspects on this is the cleanup. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as you know, when I think you were in the office the first time, that we had a tremendously difficult time in cleaning up a case in which we used a, 
an agent which set up too quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once your acrylic or your bonding agent sets up, it is set up. There's no way of flicking it off mm -hmm. like you would uh, cement from a band. Right. Definitely. And so I think that that's perhaps one of the most important aspects of any of these types of systems is to get a system which is formulated for low viscosity and for a long working time. Exactly. Is that right? Definitely. Definitely. Now, one other consideration is that you notice in the kit here a plastic bracket primer. This would be used to condition. We had spoken earlier about chemical and mechanical bond. Right. Uh, if you're going to use any type of acrylic appliance, plastic brackets or whatever, if you're using a mixed material, whether it be Excel or Phase 2, you would have to use a bla plastic bracket primer or conditioner and apply that to the acrylic surface. This would be applied in two coats. Your first coat at least one minute before you're going to bond, and you can do it even 24 hours in advance on the first coat. And your second coat would be immediately before you put your paste on your appliance. And then this will set up a chemical attraction between the paste and the acrylic appliance. What happens if you have a porcelain jacket or something like that? How do you bond to that? Uh, the best way, recommended way is to use a porcelain primer or porcelain conditioner on that, on that surface. Now, you can use any of the systems we've discussed uh, with bonding to porcelain. But the best way to, to condition it would be to acid etch the porcelain for the normal period of time, 60 you mean to 90 just seconds. With the regular etching? Regular material? phosphoric acid. You can either do that or roughen the porcelain, either one. They basically accomplish the same thing. They kind of freshen the porcelain. Rinse it, blow it dry. And then with a brush, apply a liberal coat of the porcelain primer to that porcelain surface and leave it untouched for at least 60 seconds. Go back and then apply a second coat and leave that second coat on for at least two minutes. Then go ahead and bond as normal as if it was a freshly etched tooth. But consider one thing, that you will never get as good a bond chemically to the porcelain as you would to etched enamel and mm -hmm. for obvious reasons and, and that's for debonding. We don't want to run the risk of, of uh, possibly fracturing that porcelain jacket. Now we've talked about the no mix system, we've talked about the standard mix system, and then the specialty mix system. As kind of an overview, where do all these things fit into a contemporary orthodontic practice? Which ones do you recommend? Do you sell all three to every office or what? Uh, there's a lot of offices will try and take one material and do different things with it, or will, some, some offices will have two or three materials. Uh, starting over here, from this extreme end, using the Reliabond bond or a no mix system is ideal for direct bonding. You could do indirect bonding with it, but you have to make sure, once again, that your brackets in your tray are, uh, are a good flush fit with the labial two surface. So you could do indirect with it, but it's not as recommended as it would be with, say, Excel, the specialty material. Now, I would think that if you started with a no mix system, by the time if you started on the upper second bicuspid on one side, just the physical placing of the material in a, let's say an indirect bonding technique, mm -hmm. by the time you got around to the other second bicuspid, the first one would practically be set up, wouldn't it? Well, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, however, the, the uh, majority of the polymerization or the, or the initial polymerization would, would start very, very slow just by simply having the paste contact the primer on the bracket. However, that is accelerated once it goes in the mouth and contacts primer from both sides, bracket uh -huh. and tooth. So if you are going to do indirect, you should, you should not waste time in applying the paste to all the brackets in the tray. Okay. Now how about phase two? Now phase two is a little bit more versatile, uh, ideal for your direct application, direct bonding. Uh, could be used with indirect if you can work in that two minute time frame and if the viscosity is not a problem. So this one's a little bit more versatile than the no mix. Now in the clinic here, uh, they usually will mix up a separate mix for every tooth. Is that the way you would do that? Uh, that varies. Uh, I've seen as many as six brackets done out of a mix, uh, out of a two-minute mix, which means the operator is working extremely quick. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, I think it's best to start out doing one bracket out of a mix and then branch out and do at least, uh, you should be able to do at least two to three brackets out of a mix, and that's being able to place the bracket accurately, measure it, and do your cleanup. Okay. Now, how about Excel? Obviously, you'd use Excel for any large acrylic appliance. Right. Now, how about other uses? Uh, for example, it would make sense to me that this would be a very good uh, type of agent for indirect bonding. 
Is that correct? Absolutely. This is uh, this is really ideal for it. Uh, we had uh, come across this. Uh, developed this in your office basically for the Herbst appliance and rapid paddle expanders, but it has a tremendous application for indirect, once again because it is thin and because it does give you adequate working time. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot emphasize enough how critical it is, is, is if that material is starting to set while you're applying the appliance that everything is, is thrown off. Your bond strength is thrown off plus your fit is thrown off. So therefore, uh, Excel uh, kind of fits that category without having to to worry about you know different mix ratios or mixing on a cold slab. It's just built in longer working time and thin viscosity. Okay. I'd like to, to summarize this in a sense by asking the question of, you know, you've been in many, many people's office. I know you're on the road all the time and, and interacting with individuals. What are the key things that people do incorrectly in bonding? I mean, what are the what are the things that time and time again, whether it's in the clinic here Mm -hmm. or somewhere else or in a private office? What are the things where people really make mistakes? As a general overview from the whole technique, uh, etching times are always varied. Uh, we see uh, if there's uh, a rash of failures on a certain, with a certain assistant or a certain patient or a certain uh, group of patients, uh, the etching time is always automatically increased. That's wrong. Uh, be sure to stay in that precise 60 to 90 second range. Uh, the rinsing is, is one that is not done thoroughly enough in enough offices. Maintaining a dry field uh, is another. Uh, working with the material beyond the period, uh, be beyond the dormant period, working into the gelation period uh, is another critical mistake that we mm -hmm. see time and time again. Uh, and those would probably be the majority of them. Now, there's another type of system, which is the light cured. Do you want to just briefly talk about that? The light cured, uh, of course, there are two different types of light sources on the market, or have been. That's one's, of course, ultraviolet rays and the white light or visible light rays. Uh, and, of course, right now, today, because of safety factors, the visible light is, is basically the only one that's being used uh, hmm. uh, pretty much in the dental industry today. That is a very, very uh, uh, simple technique in that you, after you acid etch, you would paint a sealant onto the... Uh, etched labial surface, uh, cure it with the light for 20 seconds, then you would apply your paste to the back of the bracket, apply the bracket to the tooth, and then cure the bracket from either the mesial distal from two sides for approximately 20 seconds per, per side, or from the lingual and the incisal edges. Okay. It's a little bit more complex because once again the material polymerizes uh, only where it's exposed to that light source for that period of time. So therefore, it is critical, and it can be a little bit more time-consuming because you have to angle the light uh, from the mesial and from the distal mm -hmm. on two separate, uh, with two separate exposures. Do you have to use the light on each tooth, or can you put on two or three brackets and then cure the bunch of them? No, unfortunately, not anymore. Uh, uh, back uh, 10 years ago, there was a quadrant light that was manufactured by Clevedent for the ultraviolet system. I bought one. And, so that, and, that, was, and that was designed for primarily for plastic brackets because uh -huh. obviously it would shine right through or with a with a perforated mesh bracket but using the the foil mesh brackets that we're all that we're seeing today that the companies are manufacturing it does require now that you have to do each tooth individually and do it from at least two angles so I take it then it's more much more time consuming right it does afford you the one benefit is that the material will not set till it's hit with the light okay uh, we've covered the field of bonding pretty thoroughly now. Are there any other comments you'd like to make uh, with regard to the material that we've talked about or any other failures or anything that you've seen? The only thing to, to, uh, I'd like to caution you on is, of course, the storage of materials. And uh, these materials are sensitive. Our, our products, the Reliance products, are uh, guaranteed for two and a half years without any refrigeration. That's at room temperature. And they're guaranteed for longer if the kit is refrigerated. Mm -hmm. A lot of the manufacturers use a different catalyst than we do. And therefore, their product does require refrigeration to maintain the shelf life. Now, if the product is not refrigerated, what can happen is you can see a variance in your setting time. And uh, this can either be a variance in the standpoint that it'll set quicker than normal or it can set slower. And the problem with it setting slower is that if, it, if, it's, if the final set is drawn out, uh, it's longer time for the patient in the chair. A lot of times you could be tying in and that material has only reached maybe 70% of its hardness and once again you can run the risk of, of uh, fracturing a bond. Okay. Well, I appreciate you taking your time today. I think we've covered this area fairly thoroughly and hopefully anybody watching this tape will 
get a much better idea of what's going on in Bonnie. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.